The Great Molasses Flood It was an average day in North Boston, a sunny and cool January afternoon in 1919. As the residents went about their daily lives, their world suddenly morphed into a scene from a B-rated horror movie with a little warning. A steel tank holding 2.3 million gallons of molasses burst open and quickly collapsed, sending a deadly and inescapable tidal wave of deadly viscous slime into the streets. Welcome to Dark History, where we unravel the most disastrous events in history. If you want to support the channel, consider subscribing and like this video. While it sounds laughable to imagine people slipping, sliding, and drowning in a rolling tide of molasses, it was actually a very serious and life-altering event for everyone living in the northern end of Boston, Massachusetts. The date was January 15, 1919. The scene was North End Park and Commercial Street. Giuseppe Iantosca stood at the window of his apartment, looking down at his son Pasquale collecting firewood near the United States Industrial Alcohol Corporation's massive molasses holding tank. The steel tank stood 50 feet tall, was 90 feet long, and 283 feet around, casting a shadow over the street below. Pasquale was helping his parents during his lunch break from school. The tank was well loved by the neighborhood children. When they were sent out to collect firewood, they would also take empty tin cans to collect the sweet molasses that dripped from the cracks in the giant tank. The United States Industrial Alcohol Corporation painted the tank brown to match the molasses in an attempt to hide the leaks, but nothing can conceal the sweet smell and the stickiness of the molasses. On this day, Pasquale and his father, along with everyone else nearby, both heard some groaning noises from the tank, but residents said that wasn't too unusual. Unfortunately, what happened next was quite unusual and hadn't ever been repeated in known history. With little warning, the molasses tank burst open at the seams. Pasquale had no time to run. His father watched in terror from the apartment window above as his son was knocked down by a large wave of molasses and disappeared into the brown mass. The molasses created a literal tidal wave estimated by some to be around 15 feet high. It traveled at 35 miles per hour, wiping out everything in its path over a two block radius. The molasses was so strong, in fact, that it knocked down neighboring apartment buildings, the train trestle, and the fire station. For Pasquale, there was no fighting the goo. The Boston Post described the experience the day after the disaster. There was no escape from the wave. Caught, human being and animal alike could not flee. Running in it was impossible. Once it smeared ahead, human or animal, there was no coughing off the sticky mass. To attempt to wipe it with hands was to make it worse. Most of those who died, died from suffocation. It plugged nostrils almost airtight. Pasquale's father Giuseppe made his way as quickly as he could through the ankle-deep slime to the spot where he'd seen his son go under. He frantically searched for hours while Pasquale's mother Maria waited in tears at their apartment window above. The Boston Globe published Pasquale's story on January 22nd, 1919. Exhausted and disconsolate, Giuseppe trudged up the dark stairs and stepped into the house. Maria was waiting for him, her eyes rimmed red from crying. Neither of them spoke. He had come home alone, and that said everything. Pasquale had been knocked down by the wave of molasses and then struck by a railroad car, which had been knocked off the tracks during the deluge. Giuseppe and Maria weren't alone in their heartbreak. In total, 21 people were killed in the flood of molasses, along with 12 horses and multiple other cats and dogs on the streets below the tank. Six of the dead were city workers who were eating their lunch when the molasses engulfed them. 150 other people were injured in the disaster. As stretchers with the injured and dead arrived at the hospital, the scene was described in the local newspaper as molasses dripping humanity. The white uniforms of nurses were coated in molasses and blood, creating an unrealistic scene that no one present would ever be able to forget. The family of Bridget Clottery was caught in the middle of the explosion, losing their home in the disaster. Bridget and her family lived in a home along Commercial Street. 
65-year-old Bridget was home with her two sons, Martin and Stephen, and their sister, Teresa, when they first felt the rush of air from the exploding tank. According to the Boston Globe, the force of air was so strong it created a vacuum that sucked the entire house out into Commercial Street where it hit the elevated train tracks ahead and was demolished as the tracks collapsed. The house was split in two pieces. Bridget was in one half of the house and the siblings couldn't locate her. They searched for more than an hour. Martin used his floating bed frame as a makeshift boat to navigate the waist-deep sludge. Bridget's body was finally found under the rubble of the house. The roof had collapsed on top of her. Rescuers tried to save the occupants of the Clottery House, which was torn from its foundation and smashed against an elevated train trestle by the molasses on June 15, 1919. Stephen Clottery was so disturbed by the accident that he was soon sent to an insane asylum, where he died a short time later. The molasses was so thick and sticky that it took multiple days for rescuers to locate all of the bodies. The last body was finally found in Boston Harbor four months after the explosion. In the end, the city had to use the powerful water hoses from the harbor's fireboat to wash away some of the molasses, using salt water to aid in the removal of the molasses. Rumor has it that the north end of Boston still smelled faintly like molasses on hot days for decades after the disaster. Molasses is a main ingredient for lots of delicious candy and desserts, like the iconic Gingerbread Man. Why did the United States Industrial Alcohol Corporation need such a huge tank of molasses? Apparently molasses has more uses than just tasty treats. It can also be quickly turned into rum or industrial alcohol. In 1915, the United States Industrial Company hastily erected the ill-fated molasses tank, over time, smell leaks and groans were regular occurrences, but no one ever expected a deadly flood of molasses to wipe out the area nearby. When the incident first occurred, the United States Industrial Alcohol Corporation blamed the collapse on anarchists or some sort of explosion. Later, it was determined that the tank was made of steel too thin to hold 2.3 million gallons of molasses. The structure was hastily built without consulting professional engineers or architects. After the incident was investigated, an engineer told the Boston Globe that the tank was made of steel 50% too thin to withstand the pressure of the molasses, and the type of steel used was too brittle. It wasn't just the faulty construction that caused the disaster. Several variables came together to create the perfect molasses storm. A few days prior to the accident, a new delivery of molasses had arrived from Puerto Rico. This molasses was warm from the southern weather. As it sat in the tank, the cold molasses and the warm molasses mixed together, releasing a gas that began to slowly increase the pressure inside. The temperature outside fluctuated that week, rising 2 degrees Fahrenheit to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, causing the warming molasses to thin out and expand, further increasing pressure within the tank. The closed tank had no way for gas and pressure to be safely released. The winter weather also contributed to the deadliness of the disaster. As the warm molasses burst out of the tank, it hit the winter air and immediately began to cool, making it thicker and more difficult to escape. If the tank had burst during the hotter summer months, the molasses would have been thinner. It would have run further and spread more, but it wouldn't have been as thick and sticky. The victims opened 119 different lawsuits against the United States Industrial Alcohol Corporation for damages in the disaster. The court cases were combined into one large lawsuit that drug on for more than five years. The case was so large it included more than 1,000 witnesses, everyone from victims to explosive experts. In the end, it was ruled that no active sabotage had taken place despite the incident happening during an increased period of terrorist activity from Italian anarchist groups leading up to World War I. Structural failure was determined to be the cause of the accident. It was ruled that poor planning and lack of oversight led up to the explosion of the molasses tank. The United States Industrial Alcohol Corporation was forced to pay the victims and their families $628,000 in damages, the equivalent of 8 million USD today. While life returned to normal for residents of Boston, this court case led to a new level of accountability in the construction industry. This against the United States Industrial Alcohol Corporation proved that the legal system could hold businesses culpable for unsafe structures. As a result, 
America's days of unregulated large-scale construction and do-it-yourself engineering came to a permanent end. Today all that remains to mark the area of such an unusual disaster is this small green sign. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please like and subscribe. See you next time.